Good evening, and welcome to uh, the second lecture in this uh, semester's open lecture series organized by Estonian Academy of Arts, Department of Architecture, and funded by the Cultural Development Fund. Uh, this semester's lectures go under the title Close Enough, so, uh, and the idea is to look at the kind of closer region that uh, sprawls around us. And I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, very close friends of mine from uh, all over the place, let's put it frankly. Uh, Eta, from officially from Riga, but uh, I met them in Vienna, but they also come from Zurich, London, Stockholm, wherever, you name it, they've been there. Um, but now they've kind of uh, put their put down in Riga, and I think when I was trying to figure out what to say to introduce them, I think they're an office that uh, first and foremost takes matters into their own hands. Uh, whatever they do, they do it uh, with full heart. And a good kind of anecdotic example of this is when, they, when we did the Baltic Pavilion together in 2015 and 16, they, uh, some, they had to form an office or a kind of legal body in Riga, and they named it Riga Architecture Institute, which is not a very <laughs> simple kind of name to pick up, but I trust they can pull it off. But now they've kind of regrouped under the name Ether, and I give the, <laughs> I give the mic over to you to <laughs> show how it's done. So uh, join me welcoming uh, Carles, Niklas, and Dagnia from Ether. Thank you, Johan. Uh, we will try our best to explain ourselves. Um, and actually, the name was still dragging till not so long ago, uh, Riga Architecture Institute. Um, OK, uh, we are relatively young, I would say, three <laughs> years, but not anymore, right? Because there are two more generations. Uh, already behind us, also working in the office, and uh, we often feel like uh, there are things that uh, we need to catch up with. Um, as Johan said, um, uh, Baltic Pavilion was kind of a um, conceptual starting point for our practice, uh, and from there, I think it has evolved uh, in more. Um, uh, precise directions, or let's say we we kind of coined it at uh, something that is between uh, nature, technology, and contemporary culture, and these are topics that we are very much um, interested in. Um, and uh, just to have a bit of recap, um, I'm sure that you might already know, but this is this letter of uh, half of the letter is the letterhead addressed to three ministries of the Baltic states, and uh, it's about uh, kind of representation of the Baltics as a region instead of uh, nation states, and we are very uh, kind of proud of this letter. Uh, so uh, in Palasport, back in the day, um, we tried to bring the transformation efforts from our region, which included the um, kind of uh, different view on uh, landscape, on geology, on transformation of infrastructure. And we very much feel that it was relevant then, and it's very relevant now, uh, as the hot topic uh, of the last weeks has been um, how much gas can we pump from Klaipada to store in Inchukans, and how long will that keep us warm. Uh, so uh, we think that, that that is extremely relevant uh, conversation and uh, we are all the time keeping our hand on the pulse of these um, discussions and events. Um, the ideas of Baltic uh, Pavilion, some of them which are coined also in the, in the Baltic Atlas book, uh, they keep living uh, their life, uh, and uh, one one of the 
the kind of innovations here is uh, for two years we have been working on making a new school for architecture in the uh, Latvian Academy of Fine Arts. Um, it's going to be a very small program. First of all, starting with masters, um, we call it the, the Baltic School of <laughs> Conceptual Practice. <laughs> Maybe this is a bit strongly said. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> uh, not really. We really want to call it the Baltic School. Uh, that's somehow uh, in our dreams. <laughs> it's uh, also in you know in the structure of it and the structure of the initial team. Uh, Roland Rema is sitting here, one of the authors of of, of the course syllabus um, uh, with Laura Lindsay and. Um, uh, many more. I'm not going to go in, in detail, but um, it's very exciting to have uh, something like this in works, uh, which would embody a lot of uh, those ideas that we stand for. And it's in essentially made up of a, of a studio and uh, four supporting platforms. Okay, but uh, that was just a short intro. <laughs> now let's get to work a little bit. And uh, we start uh, with a story from uh, Riga. Uh, we did a bit of background check with Jochen. This is interesting, apparently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just that we not uh, too quickly go to a small scale. If yeah, we start yeah. a very big scale, now we go a little bit uh, looking to the city where we moved and thought we need to know a bit more about it to start to operate well in it. <laughs> we moved to it and then we started looking where the hell did we move? Uh, actually, one idea that, uh, again, from Baltic Pavilion is that we come up with projects ourselves often without a uh, clear client or without exactly, you know, people who need it. Uh, so this is also a strange collaboration. We couldn't even first put in the contract, what are we going to do? Um, but this was uh, commissioned by think tank, Tsartus, which is actually a political kind of advisory independent uh, uh, yeah, organization. And, um, and they, they asked us to look at Riga spatially because they think that there's an enormous potential that is not used. And if you see all the cities around the Baltic Sea, uh, capital cities, uh, Riga is steadily losing uh, people since 1990s, uh, while Tallinn and Vilnius, in fact, they're doing pretty well. Uh, Riga has a completely, uh, well, not completely, but very empty center, uh, and people are moving out. They're moving to this uh, metropolitan region, which offers more space, more greenery, Better kindergartens, uh, you know, nicer environment. Private uh, fences around their gardens. Yeah, suburbia. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, we thought, okay, uh, how about we, we look at most livable cities? Are they really empty uh, in Europe? And it turns out, no, they're actually really dense uh, and quite uh, populated. Riga is not even in that list. Uh, so we tried to map uh, how that how how Riga population looks like. Where where do people live? And and it turns out they live uh, mainly in the Soviet multi-housing blocks. And uh, it's a kind of very low density city. It's kind of completely uh, eroded, as you can see in this drawing very well, uh, and has gaps in between the parts where people live. So our hypothesis was to identify um, a former industrial su uh, ring, basically like a railway ring around the city center and uh, see whether that could propose uh, an opportunity for redensifying um, the city. And uh, if you look at cross section, uh, that's, that's the center and here's that yellow railway ring, which in fact is uh, around 10 square kilometers of territory and could potentially place 200,000 uh, inhabitants and, and so on. So actually, th through help of, of that ring, um, the city center could also recover and also the micro 
districts in the uh, outskirts could uh, go through a kind of quicker transformation process. What is inter interesting about this um, project was that uh, we analyzed Riga through economic vectors and kind of um, driving forces that could be uh, most powerful in uh, executing this operation because they are already there and they have the biggest potential. So they were high, highest education and innovation, ICT, uh, culture for Riga specifically, uh, and uh, the housing stock. So that railway belt, in our opinion, was uh, a possibility to create a new livable image of the city because uh, Vilnius has it, Tallinn has it, pretty good. Uh, and Riga still is kind of lying on uh, former merits. So, uh, just quickly running through, for housing, we found out that there is 38% of people who don't have access to affordable housing because they don't qualify as uh, poor, you know, they can, cannot have social benefits and they don't qualify to get uh, a proper loan to uh, to buy actually um, a good apartment. So they are actually without access <laughs> to housing. So we started mapping and um, uh, prioritizing areas which in fact uh, could be looked at in terms of housing and how. Uh, so very radically, three parts, the city center, the railway ring and this micro uh, districts uh, and what what needs to be done in each. Uh, so we are talking about uh, complex renovation processes. We are talking about uh, regeneration of the the center, including a social uh, agenda, uh, avoiding gentrifying and uh, gentrification and uh, new housing clusters in the railway belt, who could be combined with um, uh, these economic vectors. Um, so, uh, culture, very interestingly, uh, Latvia has one of the highest spending in culture, but in terms of ranking of uh, cultural vibrancy, we are at the very end. And why is that? So we found out that actually people simply don't have access to most of the institutions because they are all packed in the city center, which is of course empty. Uh, so it's not uh, very difficult. Um, conclusion to make and then we uh, develop strategies also for culture what to do uh, in these separate parts to bring uh, the culture out from their physical buildings in the center in the public space um, to um, introduce culture in this railway belt but uh, by making collaborations with these institutions making also um, a free infrastructure for local and international uh, artists that is not bound to any specific theater troupe, for example, uh, black box, and things like that. And then culture in the micro districts, which should be more about community involvement, using existing infrastructure of schools and uh, kindergartens and libraries and lots of things that are already there. IT. Uh, we are near Cyprus and Malta for investment and research and development. Surprising. Uh, what can be done? Uh, Riga has a kind of, I would say, uh, absolutely amazing maverick uh, attempts of IT companies to kind of cluster together and actually build communities and build um, neighborhoods such as Vefresh initiative um, and and then there are three universities on the left bank which is called even the knowledge mile yet uh, it's all very um, it seems that it just happened to be that way and uh, it's not included in any policy you know and uh, when when a new uh, development uh, comes to the left bank uh, we, we are saying it should have like um, at least a strategy, a guidebook, uh, what needs to be included in the program to kind of strengthen that knowledge mile. Um, so 
uh, here we are exploring the railway infrastructure and um, using that as a as a drone corridor uh, in future that could also link to satellites of biomedicine network linking to hospitals, linking to the airport, transporting organs along these uh, railway tracks one day. This is all uh, very feasible in our opinion and uh, it should be done in fact. Um, everything is just too slow and too inert <laughs> as, we, as we know. Uh, so that's about uh, Riga X. Maybe uh, I missed. Oh, yeah. So the way we did it uh, after the research, we uh, made conferences and we made public uh, talks at the city council, at the um, Department of Development, at uh, the Cultural, Cultural Ministry, um, and uh, everyone was included. But um, on the other hand, we we brought these ideas also to our project. So maybe Carlos will take on. Yeah, uh, a bit about our project. So one thing is, of course, we work with these concepts and theories and large scale uh, thinking, but uh, we also uh, want to bring this into reality. And we started working with the first project, which is nearby. Uh, this railway ring, uh, it's a territory called Vefresh that Niklaus mentioned before, and it's a technological cluster um, that uh, brings together a lot of IT companies, and uh, our idea was how to bring it into one uh, kind of inhabitable, livable uh, uh, identity and infrastructure that works uh, for this cluster. So these are the companies and uh, these are the two areas that uh, needed to be connected because they have the same uh, tenants or similar tenants and they they want to create this uh, one one name called Vefresh. Uh, so we worked a lot with the infrastructure and finding new ways of accessing public space which was lacking there and uh, uh, this is the area. This is a historic. On the right side, you see historical VEF fa factory, that historically has been a place where a lot of electronics have been developed. So, there it's not a coincidence that uh, this this area is somehow linked to technology, since technology has been always there uh, from day one. Uh, so we developed uh, new concepts for railway sta uh, uh, tram stations, uh, innovative trans. Train, tram stations that uh, would somehow uh, improve the conditions of the street. Uh, we looked for new kinds of public spaces, uh, for a public space where we could have it, and we came across this fantastic uh, velo dr dr dome uh, uh, just in the area, because we realized that there are there is an interesting pattern of uh, trees growing uh, in a noble. Uh, you can see it on the right side. And then after research, it came across that this used to be a velo track. And these are 100-year-old trees that we felt like we wouldn't need to do much, just uh, basically open the park to people. So of course, we felt very uh, encouraged by this project that existed there. Uh, it was a, the gray uh, big box was supposed to be a court building that kind of chops the park in the middle. But since it was not going on for a while, we, we went to, we did a nice sketch and we went to uh, ministries. They really liked it till, uh, till uh, some news came in light that there is a top secret project by National Security uh, Service and no one knew about it but uh, the park is going to be demolished and uh, there's no way uh, uh, these trees can be saved because it's for national interest and even government cannot tell to people, uh, hey, you know, uh, uh, this this is a secret. So they had to reveal this plan and people went to streets, there were votes uh, combined to for this to be decided in a parliament and uh, 
basically it came to almost breaking the government uh, because uh, people <laughs> were just really upset by this and uh, we hope that uh, from this this kind of let's say project started very different in beginning and it ended up uh, somehow uh, becoming uh, uh, a precedent for a way how the pu public space should be dis discussed before with the local community and that you have to respect uh, the voice of uh, inhabitants and this this kind of we hope will carry on because this went really more heavy than the politicians ever thought it would uh, so this is that project. Um, the second project where we went hands-on was a competition in the uh, Kimmel Quarter. It's a, a central area in the, it's a former brewery in the center. And uh, we, it was a competition for basically boring A-class offices and uh, so we thought, what could we do? Because uh, the idea of this uh, historical uh, brewery um, uh, somehow having this industry in the city is very close to us and also the research we did with Riga X uh, that we felt like this uh, light industry and places that could allow for more than uh, mono-functional offices to move in would be great and we felt like this is the place because it used to be like this, this could allow more freedom and so we uh, proposed this plan by bringing a new uh, typology in, in the city center. Uh, most, most of the area was already cleaned by, by the developers so it wasn't much about what we keep but uh, instead of that we added somehow the industry back and uh, we proposed this building that would be a sort of uh, a hybrid between office and a warehouse and uh, uh, six meter high ceilings uh, for uh, three uh, for the office where you could rent not only square meters but instead cubic meters and um, this is the view from the square and uh, this would work in a way that uh, this new typology we would uh, build every second floor, uh, but uh, in order to increase the square meters, the idea is to bring, uh, bring a gallery floor uh, in that could be prefab wood structure uh, that could be easily transported with the elevator and set up in, let's say, a day or two, and you could uh, use uh, very flexibly the space. Uh, and this would, uh, of course, be a lot about the ways how the new tenants want to modulate or, or use these spaces. Uh, it, it, it would be a sort of a typology with, that works as a kind of machine with very efficient uh, uh, ac access to all the, uh, all the ventilation, electricity, all that would be there, but... Uh, uh, it would allow for, let's say, a startup to come in and choose where they have a double height space, where they have meeting space, in case they need some kind of bigger machines. All would be possible because uh, the floors would be able to carry those loads. So uh, uh, this we worked also with Transolar on a climate for that uh, uh, whole neighborhood, and we. Our idea was that we try to use the elements that exist uh, in that historical setting and also come up with new ones like uh, ventilation via solar chimneys, for example. Uh, and uh, historical uh, brewery, uh, we proposed to have instead a clubhouse uh, that would have a, a great mix of different functions. Uh, and uh, in the chimney, uh, we made a vertical library. <laughs> and now it's a bit. Oh, yeah. oh, maybe I do like this. Ah. That's fine. I think you hear me, no? Like this, yeah. Uh, picking up from um, 
conversion project, which we unfortunately didn't win like a couple of other uh, big competitions in Riga Center. We already see it's a pattern. So <laughs> we are not at all worried about it. <laughs> Maybe I just uh, put in that Silla wrote, uh, this is an uh, avant-garde uh, lecture tonight. And it kind of, uh, we uh, want to prove that we are avant-garde, but maybe one proof uh, <laughs> is uh, that we didn't win the previous competition that Carlos uh, explained, because in Riga often people don't know what to do with our projects, you know, they're like, what is this? Who, who did this? Why? What, what are they talking about? But to encourage you, actually, we found now, like, uh, we work on two other projects in Riga City, and we found, actually, a developer who is interested, so there is always a continuation for kind of, you start a bit naive, but uh, it, it might land somewhere, you know. Um, on that note, uh, <laughs> we started also with this project, really naive. <laughs> um, it's a small uh, house um, who... Uh, is actually was an existing house uh, for, and we are doing it for two um, amazing um, uh, friends, um, allies. One is an um, uh, artist, Indrichis Gelsis, and the other is Sabine Skarl, who is a fashion designer. And basically, the idea was to make the house almost as a culture project we collaborating with them and being inspired by what they do and and uh, and kind of uh, always this process um, back and forth. So they bought this um, ruin, uh, which is something like a 2002 project uh, built so far. The second floor was supposed to be on top of it. Uh, it's in um, uh, at the outskirts of Riga. And... Um, so they showed us this picture at some point because uh, they were like, okay, what should we, <laughs> we do with this? <laughs> and we looked at it and we said, this already looks great. <laughs> I think we should just keep it as it is and make it a house. <laughs> um, that's how we started. Uh, you, you see it's like over time with graffitis and like always like the, uh, the way we work is actually document it, scan it, then have this point cloud and then research it, check what we like, uh, some images of the house. And what is amazing is that, you know, on these, these uh, walls on top of it, uh, like it's just unfinished, but we thought finally, normally in a building, no one would allow you to just build some kind of sculptural walls on the roof. And this was a great way to just say, ah, they were there, so we keep them. They will be now the sculptures on the roof. So we had a really good meaning to um, keep it uh, up. Um, this is a model uh, poured in um, gips, Yes, never do it again, better in concrete. <laughs> so, uh, it, it really, I think, shows um, the house as this stone, as this monolith that we wanted to achieve. Uh, important is that this was the original project. Um, it was supposed to look like this, uh, with a garage. Uh, currently, in the garage, uh, garage is gone. Uh, uh, currently in the house, the bedroom is in the basement and we don't have the second floor, so big changes. Basically, there's a big plate uh, in between the first and second floor now as a roof. Um, here you can see from the left um, uh, the existing, um, then the red one what we remove, and then the blue one is what comes new. So we did some cuts also in the floor slabs in order to create a uh, more special um, spatial experience. And the whole house, actually the roof of it is uh, holding on two small, oh, I don't remember now, 15 centimeter diameter, I think, uh, steel columns and a very long steel beam in the middle that you can see. I uh, see. Oh, no, I yeah, better don't use this. Oh, no. <laughs> um, the blue uh, thing in the, in the third image. And um, this is a section of the house. And um, actually, do we have a pointer? No, we don't have. No. Oh, but it's okay. Maybe, maybe I try to. I cannot show the uh, airflow. <laughs> Uh, like, yeah. does it work? No. Ah, something. Can you yeah, maybe it's good. Uh -huh. Ah, this works. Um, so basically, this is the basement floor, um, and this is the ground floor. Uh, the whole idea is the house would have a, mm, a 
natural ventilation. And we are building the first uh, solar chimney in Baltics, uh, which is also a, a great experiment. <laughs> so here is a glass, uh, uh, glass, uh, just like a double glazed glass. Uh, it heats up in the summer and pulls out the hot air of the house. And the fresh air comes in through this great uh, uh, tube, uh, which actually uh, is coming from Estonian producer, <laughs> it's the largest uh, pipe you can get for the sewage. Um, so this is a secondary entrance in the house that leads down to the uh, river, to the small creek, and that's where the fresh air in the summer comes in. So basically, the fresh air would come in. Okay, you understand. It comes in like this, travels through the house, and gets sucked, uh, hot air gets sucked out by the solar chimney. Um, in the plan, uh, maybe I don't go too much in the details. On the right side up is the bedroom, which is double height, and the bathroom is uh, also on the same floor, and on the top floor, everything is open, um, and uh, having an access to terrace to the uh, to the and garden. And that's the original plan, right? Yes, it's the outline state as it was. Um, we are unfortunately needed to uh, demolish a bit more than expected because of some structural stabilities and also client wanted to have more openings and more uh, uh, experience in the house. So for that reason, we needed to modify it a bit more. However, the, all the new things we build and uh, we add, we still try to keep Actually, we're using the same brick, uh, uh, similar brick that, that was uh, already there, and um, this is the oops. this is the main uh, floor, uh, living floor, where you can see the big window at the end, and down there in that hole is the uh, bed. So this is the bed with a double height, and the uh, uh, the pipe that connects you to the garden. And um, we're using the materials that we uh, uh, got from the uh, demolished bricks. They are now, um, they were um, smashed in, in pieces and we will use them for the facade stucco, which currently we, we are kind of uh, starting to do the samples of the facade stucco. The house actually was supposed to be already uh, under the roof uh, by the end of the last year, but it, gets, it got all a bit slower, so um, we are picking up this spring, um, the, the construction process. View from the uh, garden to the big window, the solar chimney on top, and the, um, and the entrance in the uh, basement floor. Uh, another view with the facade, which is this uh, slightly more rough uh, stucco, and uh, the conversion process of uh, cutting out concrete blocks and we will try to reuse them also in some landscape elements and um, and as I, we mentioned uh, we like to do more culture also <laughs> with the project um, the idea was that at some point when the building is um, done uh, when the ground floor walls are finished um, we do a fashion show so the the um, Sabine, who is uh, the owner of the house, there would be the fashion show, and now we will. It's a kind of a storyboard.
Next project already. Uh, uh, do you need, need a break from the fashion show? No, okay. So um, uh, our first uh, finished uh, public building, um, daycare center in Cesis, which is uh, approximately one and a half hour drive from Riga. Um, 700 square meet, 750 square meter of um, space uh, for uh, people with special needs. Uh, kids and grown-ups where they would go during the daytime and spend their time it's almost like their house uh, we kind of also thought about it that it's kind of a large villa in the green um, it's also not so large it's all in one floor um, but uh, most uh, the ma main idea was to uh, create spaces where people feel comfortable uh, where they can uh, do creative things where they can learn things and get the necessary um, services. This is a, yeah, okay, this is a, a building process, <laughs> digging in the first zone, but this was already a long time ago. This, you can see in the middle, the triangular form of the uh, building, which is sitting in this, it's actually exactly at the border of uh, entering the, uh, the city. And, um, yeah, local residents were not knowing what it's going to be, so they thought it's some kind of uh, military object or like a it looks like a plane or an alien ship, a bit. <laughs> and then it's it's looking down. The terraces are the ones where you can see the cutout uh, zigzag, uh, all to the really nice landscape that slightly uh, goes down the hill. Um, I will not go into detail in the <laughs> floor plan. <laughs> Uh, some shots from the construction process because actually we don't have a finished building images. It's just uh, two weeks ago, uh, final furniture and equipment was installed and we haven't managed to photograph it all. And, uh, and uh, this is from already uh, some uh, time ago. Um, the main kind of uh, uh, event hall um, where you can see a lot of uh, opening because we needed to make a building small due to construction costs uh, and budget. We were extremely limited in the budget. So the idea was, okay, let's squeeze it, but let's make large openings so you have a, uh, a kind of a feeling that space is bigger and the large uh, openings are also there ending in a terrace. So it always feels your room is larger than, um, than um, actually. Uh, the pergolas, the kind of a sunshade, um, uh, roof for the terrace uh, that brings always a new pattern on the terrace according to the day and according to the uh, uh, season. Uh, office visiting uh, before the uh, concrete poured in, uh, in, uh, in the south facade. This is facade from the street with the main uh, kind of uh, entrance and still uh, the local, uh, the builders trying to get the circles and the corners uh, straight. Um, by doing this project, we actually realized that um, we are uh, kind of naive and idealistic, trying to do many custom things. And we realized it's a problem in a public procurement process where uh, always the cheapest uh, construction company wins. And if you don't have a, a kind of standardized solutions, it's very difficult to achieve uh, quality and to collaborate even. Um, we are not giving up, uh, not at all, that you will see in our next project. Uh, however, it was really good learning to see what 
why actually in um, in Latvia uh, it's difficult to achieve a kind of a special solu special kind of architecture or um, so it's it's basically in the system. Um, which hopefully and, and changes. And it didn't them. help uh, moving from Switzerland to Latvia. <laughs> it uh, didn't help. But, yeah, so but because the gap is so big uh, between these two c uh, countries, it's for us so easy not to accept what's going on and uh, not to kind of... Yeah, because we actually started to build this building. We're thinking, ah, oh, during the process, we will decide what's the best solution with the construction guys. It's going to be great. It's like always like, you know... They will come with good proposals. They will come with good proposals, how it's easier for them to do this. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> oh my god, that was the most large disappointment of collaboration in my life, I think. So mm, far. Well, but um, it's still a nice building and people have moved in now and uh, yeah, uh, it will live its life. So the best, the best lessons, of course, uh, we try to learn and, and uh, not to do the same mistakes again. So um, we are currently working on uh, another public building in such a short time. So we are only active three years, and this is already the second uh, building, 3,500 square meters, kindergarten in one of the booming uh, suburbs of Riga. Um, and um, this project is um, actually the site is incredibly beautiful it's on a kind of historical dune and um, when we when we did this uh, competition and both of the projects we won through competitions we um, wanted to keep as many trees as possible to make the building really uh, compact but at the same time really um, connect to this uh, beautiful landscape that is um, all around so it's uh, sitting on this old dune and here on the left-hand side, there is uh, the main street of this village. So um, you have a swimming pool, actually, which is like a public uh, uh, domain of the building. Then the rest of the building is uh, towards more private part uh, uh, in two levels. Uh, we collaborated with the Lithuanian uh, landscape architect, uh, uh, Agne Dailudaite, and uh, her approach was really beautiful. Uh, she said, uh, sometimes uh, all you need uh, the children to understand is that they are standing on top of a dune, there are certain kinds of trees there, and then, then lower down there are there's a garden, and then there's the river down there. And this kind of uh, realization that down there is a river is uh, actually everything that you need. Uh, so that was the... Uh, landscape concept to somehow keep this existing biodiversity which is already there to enhance it, to strengthen it and to allow uh, kids to play in the, this different uh, um, uh, landscape parts, understanding where they are instead of like a random playground. Climatically uh, a very challenging building and why? Because we don't have a gas pipe next to it. Uh, so that presents a lot of challenges when you have to heat uh, a large swimming pool all year around and you need to also keep the building cool in the summertime. Uh, so it's going to operate most likely on two uh, ground source heat pumps, which uh, will be these vertical ones. No one still knows in Latvia how to do them. Apparently, but so I have good <laughs> hopes for Estonians who who do know. Um, we are in touch with some, uh, and and um, and that's how we will um, address the energy aspects of this building, uh, allowing parts of it to be naturally ventilated, of course. Um, swimming pool. We will see later in another project, but we are very interested in. Um, in aspects um, of uh, therapy. Uh, there is a salt chamber in here, there are uh, showers, there, is a, there are sensory rooms in this project. We are trying to make uh, this uh, building really like a kind of sensory playground as well for the kids so they can really enjoy full spectrum of, um, of what it can offer. Uh, the pool has a large, very low window to the forest uh, and that's how the building is uh, going down. 
Uh, I will also not go into too much detail, but the purple part is uh, the kind of shared and collective spaces that the kids use. You don't have any corridors uh, there. They're all playing around this inner courtyard, uh, which um, we understand as a gallery uh, that uh, is connected to all the uh, event spaces and but actually the main idea was huh? in the competition remember when we had these boxes yeah. we were like ah but it's okay but it's something a little bit like what could we do and then <laughs> Nick took a pen and he was like we need to somehow bring in the landscape and he was like <laughs> so the, <laughs> the, 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 the landscape uh, uh, plan somehow turned into the building um, uh, building plan um, yeah which is probably not the easiest move but uh, <laughs> and we are paying for it with our hard work <laughs> uh, but it, it creates a lot of qualities so we're trying to see where this leads us for example part of the courtyard has the existing topography keeping the existing trees and that produces a potential for a slide um, Another view in the galleries. So the, the gallery will really be like a, a bit of a, a maze where you can uh, run around and explore. And sometimes there will be uh, wardrobes, for example, in front of the classrooms that will um, uh, filter the light through. And uh, everyone will understand uh, their individual um, uh, little homes uh, in, this, uh, in this building. So, going out of it, uh, there's a lot also in the landscape, but uh, not today. Um, I, I felt obliged to speak about this project because it was also on a lot of posters. Uh, it's kind of a drama uh, project uh, in Latvia <laughs> Expo. Uh, but it helped us to start our own exactly. practice. Exactly. So, so we don't we're say very anything. very thankful uh, to this project. This is uh, actually yeah our uh, start. It even gave us the name. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's um, uh, so for 2020, uh, the plan was to to make the expo. Then no one knew of COVID then, and our approach was uh, uh, kind of homage to um, uh, Super Studios' continuous monu uh, monument, uh, the idea about this uh, endless um, field uh, of, of uh, infrastructure that uh, would uh, kind of fulfill all of our wishes, but uh, we, we twisted this um, plane into, uh, into a, a wrap of its own uh, introducing also the, the virtual and digital aspects of our uh, societies nowadays that are uh, more and more uh, present. Um, the key thing about this pavilion, you have to imagine you're in Dubai, and we went there also uh, many times. Uh, it's really hot, but this is Dubai winter time, so again working with uh, the genius mind of Matthias Schuller, uh, we figured out a way to do a soft conditioning of the pavilion to keep it open. Uh, so it would not be an air-conditioned box, but instead uh, the wind would be flowing through just right. Uh, we would have an innovative um, um, uh, panels in the floor that are made from Latvian plywood and uh, uh, capillaries uh, and uh, stainless steel sheets. Uh, the funny thing is that stainless steel is uh, a low E material, low e emissivity material, which means uh, on the top part, where it's just the steel, it, it reflects the heat away from the pavilion. But in the lower part, where it's covered with silicon anti-slip pattern, it uh, produces a high emissivity, and so it uh, transfers from capillaries the heat or the coldness of uh, the heat to the users. So it would really be uh, a kind of uh, quite complex piece, but it would showcase uh, Latvian uh, building materials and uh, innovative technologies which uh, have enormous potential, of course, in the, in the Middle East uh, market <laughs> because they 
uh, have one of the most um, uh, polluted uh, cities, actually. And um, they are more and more interested in how uh, to improve uh, them. And uh, this is actually, we think, is, is the right way to go. That there's something that they could also learn from us. Um, it's just a, a one uh, tube resisting all the loads. Uh, and then there is a module, a steel module, uh, with some infrastructures next to it. Um, I think also this project showcase uh, somehow for us is, um, is kind of an uh, important uh, statement for how we think about the climate, because um, we don't think that it has to be, you know, we think that our bodies can adapt. So of course, inside the pavilion, you wouldn't have plus 18 degrees like all the other conditioned pavilions. But it's okay; you don't need it, because if outside is plus 28 and you walk in and there's plus 24, plus 22, it's already better. It's, it's nice already and pleasant, helps. like in the shade. We, we think that we are not like a machines. It's not like you have to be calculated. You know, it's kind of. Um, this is again the difficulty in the code which asks you to do this standard, this standard, this standard building because it's easy to control it. It's easy to control the uh, house and measure it and give you permit. But there are many other ways how in fact we could live much uh, more, how to say, uh, even appropriate to how our body acts because actually being in Dubai is horrible. You are outside, there are 45 degrees, and then you go inside where it's 18. And it's so unhealthy, so many people just get sick by uh, having these huge temperature changes. Um, so we always try to, um, in our projects, that's why also the solar uh, chimney in the, in the, um, in the uh, private house, uh, which again doesn't help actually for us in the code, but we know it will be less uh, energy used from the client. It will, you know, it's good for uh, having it. But what I want to try to say, not always what what is asked by measurements is the the the, the best kind of uh, um, yeah. I mean, legally, it's it's really interesting that the house actually is still. Uh, riding on that old building permit a little bit, and that's why we are allowed to do certain things that we would not be allowed to do now. So actually, the legal frameworks uh, we are not very fond of where they're currently standing and where they're going. So basically, right now uh, in Latvia, the, the energy efficiency means that the house is completely sealed, there is just air supply and the uh, heat exchanger on it and you cannot open a window. So you are kind of locked in there and that's great. Um, but to finish with this project, um, ah, here you see also the prototype panels and uh, emissivity tests with uh, silicons uh, and the exhibition space. <laughs> Ah, and some some uh, model tests of of reflections, um, which were, which could be yeah. Some people say it's inception. Some people say it's kind of without uh, a horizon line, kind of uh, Im immersive space. Uh, would be really uh, amazing to see it. But I'm sure we will one day. Uh, question is how. Where there you see long reflections here. Um, yes, so <laughs> how, to, how to say it uh, more politely? <laughs> government again. <laughs> <laughs> government? So we are working against government. Um, uh, so the political uh, intrigues uh, made the situation in such a way that the, the ministry uh, terminated the contract with the Chamber of uh, Commerce, and Chamber of Commerce was our client. So actually, we uh, lost the client for this project because their contract with the ministry was terminated. Uh, they simply couldn't uh, agree on things. There were other political interests. Uh, ministry cut the budget uh, from 4.4 million to 1.4, so 3 million moved to other agendas. And instead, the minister went uh, and signed uh, uh, 
uh, in the Emirates, uh, uh, just a contract to, to rent an existing space and put there uh, just some, you know, exhibition stands. But, uh, we were so far, it was, we were, we open, were everything was so confirmed, it was about to start to build. Yeah, so project was, um, a final design was uh, accepted by Dubai authorities, by Expo, and even Expo included it in the seven uh, legacy. legacy pavilion shortlist, which means it, will be, it would, be, would have been cheaper for our government, they wouldn't have to um, take it apart, uh, it could stay there after the Expo. And could be used, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> for all the Bitcoin <laughs> users here, uh, this project is for sale. Uh, <laughs> uh, for for more details, please DM. Uh, uh, okay, uh, the final, the last one. Uh, then we will be done. Uh, are you doing with I, I think we're fine. So it's. Um, uh, I'll not talk maybe too much. Um, so the last one is an um, exhibition we did uh, two years ago uh, in um, Arkades in Stockholm, um, Swedish, Sweden's National Center for Architecture and Design. And the title of the exhibition is Weird Sensation Feels Good. So it's basically the first exhibition that uh, showcases or talks about um, ASMR. And um, it's... Uh, kind of contribution to the design world, or tries to position it in the design world. Yeah, I will explain <laughs> what is ASMR. <laughs> I already expected, probably, it's, uh, no one knows. Ah, 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 no, no, not now. Now we have to do this, I think. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I did this first time, <laughs> and I'm not trying to be an <laughs> ASMR artist, I have to say this. Um, so, um, uh, ASMR is um, Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. Probably you know, it's kind of a, a lot of YouTube videos um, in internet where uh, people are just uh, um, washing fluffy dogs and you want to look at it forever or uh, you see some visual uh, things that you just are obsessed with and you continue to looking, looking at them. You see someone cooking, uh, chopping onions, and that makes you relaxed. So uh, exhibition is about um, all of this, all this world of sensation. And uh, here is one small example of uh, visual ASMR, uh, which is a contribution by um, uh, Andreas Wennerstedt. Um, which is a kind of a continuous, uh, satisfying video of always flowing a greenish silicon pipes. <laughs> or it's a um, skin phone prototype, which you kind of touch and, and uh, uh, basically can negotiate the iPhone. Or actually one of the first ASMR artists uh, has been Mm, kind of um, uh, talked about is Bob Ross, maybe you know, he's this American TV series where he would paint the, uh, explain and show how he paints a landscape painting and a lot of kids would fall asleep while he's doing this. Um, so, uh, and adults as well. And adults as well. <laughs> uh, so I think now you maybe understand what we are talking about. And um, this is the exhibition that we did. Uh, this is the space uh, with um, mostly um, videos uh, exhibited. So, of course, it's a huge challenge how to exhibit videos and how to make the space that would make you feel intimate and uh, protected, uh, that you can watch the video, can immerse in this world and can be relaxed. So in some ways, a kind of a new type of a contemporary synthetic spa. So we all go to spa or sauna to relax. And this is kind of first time bringing out ASMR from your bedroom to the public space. And uh, it was an experiment, of course. We didn't know if one would be able to relax. How would people act? Would they like it? Would they not like it? And um, yes. Um, uh, some shots from the exhibition, 
as I said, uh, chandeliers are the main kind of exhibits holding the videos, uh, handmade um, ha uh, hands that are kind of silicone hands which hand over you the uh, headphones that they can uh, listen to the uh, listen to the video and watch it. And this is before the entering, you would uh, place on a robe, so you would feel like you're in some special kind of uh, sensory space. Also because of practic practical reasons, of course. Um, and um, the section. So actually, it all happened in Boxen, which is a kind of experimental um, room in the whole large museum where exhibitions are supposed to um, run for four till six weeks. And they're basically experimenting, be bringing exhibition idea to a further level. Um, and uh, we were lucky, our exhibition, or unlucky, uh, our exhibition opened uh, when the pandemic lockdown was on its highest peak. Um, it was prolonged from four weeks to six months, um, which of course uh, made us a lot of concerns because whenever you design something which meant for only four weeks, suddenly it needs to last for six months. So. Um, a lot of maintenance was done also during this time to uh, the exhibition, but thanks because Swedish, um, uh, like they took pretty really good care of it. Um, the plan of the exhibition, where you can see the um, all the exhibits and the main topic, sausage below. <laughs> uh, so basically, the uh, whole point was to build in um, a sofa, a huge sofa, where people could find their. Uh, place um, and uh, watch the videos, and you can see uh, the people are almost the si as the same size as the one tube, so uh, you can really find very comfortably how you kind of immerse in this. So the two main components of the exhibition, um, uh, which kind of was our main guideline. Mm. And I will skip over. Of course, it's interesting how you, in the end, produce and build something which is almost, which is actually mm -hmm. computer generated, partially. And with special mm -hmm. software, we grew the pattern. How was it called? These are uh, growth algorithms that are observed uh, in nature, in, uh, for example, um, moss, moss and. Um, leach. Yeah, leach, and um, leach. Um, especially. And yeah, this uh, confluence of um, technology and nature was something that we felt very strongly is in the uh, essence of ASMR because uh, people use technology to amplify very simple things and that gives them this kind of light euphoria and uh, that's how they are able to relax. And everyone has a different trigger and uh, there was con there were concerns in the first exhibition. They even wanted first to to sign, make people sign something that uh, they are aware of the risks. You know, some video suddenly triggers the opposite sensation, and you feel so disgusted that you are not able to take it. Luckily, everything was fine. And uh, it was more than fine. It was people, the opposite. People who <laughs> never go to museums uh, spent uh, hours and hours in this exhibition. Sometimes even falling Filling asleep, asleep. Uh, watching a video, falling asleep, then waking up, <laughs> moving around in the space, uh, watching something else. Yes, the installation process, which uh, happened partially due to uh, due to the lockdown, happened through WhatsApp because we were not able to fly over to Stockholm. But you can see this kilometer-long uh, sausage pillow that was uh, man mounted on a great uh, pattern with a great struggle, <laughs> trying five times to get it <laughs> in place. Um, and uh, ah, this I don't have to do anything now. The production process, we actually produced the fabric in uh, Pernu. It was the only factory who wasn't laughing at me when I needed the fabric in uh, uh, So the amount was, I don't remember, a lot of kilos, uh, maybe 200 kilos of fabric. Uh, and we needed it yesterday. <laughs> basically, that was the goal. That, that's um, probably what we really love about uh, Baltics, Baltics and being also in Baltics, having the studio in Baltics, that all of these things you can do, you are mm. able to do it, you can go directly to the person who is making it and they would allow you to use their equipment, say, sure, you want to do this? Let's do it. Uh, we were printing uh, once uh, the UV, uh, with the UV printer, 
uh, something uh, like night before exhibition and said, throw in there what you want. Throw in a door in there. Uh, let's print a door. Uh, it's amazing, you know, and that, that spirit is often lost in Switzerland and in Austria, you know, where everything needs a certain reglament in order mm. to do it. But here, it's possible. possible. Yeah, actually, the exhibition wouldn't have been possible if we wouldn't produce most of the big parts in the Baltics and ship it over because everything, everything that needed any type of uh, human labor was out of the budget. Um, and um, yes, the fabric actually is uh, organic, uh, is no, here it was not organic, in next show it will be. So it's a cotton, it's raw cotton, it's not bleached. Uh, it's just like purely coming out of the thread, out of the factory and uh, the tone of it is how, how it's naturally. Um, yeah, how it is. Some exhibition shots. Uh, uh, this is one of my favorite images. I think it shows somehow that uh, this idea of a close um, listening, close uh, looking and close feeling. And um, some of the exhibits. Also the size of um, uh, the sausage was very, was very important so that it kind of is similar to a body and uh, and that you feel somehow not alone in that space even if you are so uh, kind of mentally it's a comforting uh, sp dimension that we explored um, yeah. um, and of course out of this project grew thousand ideas <laughs> or basically we got obsessed with this uh, um, kind of a the, the, the feelings that it makes and the opportunities that it gives. Um, also talking to the, uh, to the daycare center that we're building, the, um, the director, when she saw, saw the images of the ex exhibition, she actually said she wants this sofa in her center because it's, um, it's very therapeutic, the, how you look at it. And that's how kind of we started to think that actually it's uh, it's for us it's not at all not only a pattern it's it's really something that embeds much more, um, and um, uh, yes so some so basically we are interested in this. This is the image that shows very well that these were two people who I think fell asleep. I think this is the image. Um, because now a lot of public buildings, uh, kindergartens and daycare centers have this uh, task to. Uh, make a sensory room and I don't know probably also here I don't know how it's called maybe in English I don't know uh, so and it, no, nowhere ever, no one ever knows what is it exactly so if I think it's a kind of a new brief how, what is it because uh, the direct understanding in Riga what we found out is uh, let's put in some colorful um, uh, China, uh, ch China produced uh, curtains and some uh, water bed and, and, and just pile up the room with different kind of gadgets. So we think it's also another way how you could approach it and make the whole room as a special, special um, place. Uh, this is uh, the daycare center. Uh, they kind of the big sofa project uh, developed in a um, more potato project <laughs> um, because they actually needed. Um, it's interesting. So what you see, it's not a carpet and it's not a sofa. It's something in between. Um, which uh, because the daycare center they needed uh, mattresses where the people can sleep uh, in a daytime a nap. <laughs> then they needed uh, carpets just for uh, family kind of uh, homey feeling, and then they needed uh, sofas where people would sit. <laughs> it was like okay, let's do one universal piece, and um, yeah, so the, this all pieces actually fit in the main hall, all covered the whole uh, floor. I don't have a picture of it yet. Um, and uh, where they can spend their time and watch TV. And also, for example, in the image on the right, um, someone who, who, has, who is very, how to say, um, uh, active and needs to calm down, uh, then they put this person in this room and they go wild there. Um, so it's, it's kind of a becoming a part of this uh, 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 daycare center life. So, um, Yes, we are developing this further into kind of therapeutic ASMR objects, um, mattresses and weight blankets, trying to get it to some sort of production, and also some more special pieces, uh, which are um, also in production currently. Prototype is being made. 
Um, and also we're thinking further, uh, maybe this idea, the ASMR inspired world uh, can be bring something new to the architecture. Maybe there are future ASMR theaters, uh, uh, concert halls and uh, what, I don't know what else, <laughs> a lot of other libraries. things. Libraries, yes, libraries. This is just a picture from a project we would really love to build. Uh, we are hoping a lot, a lot, <laughs> every day. <laughs> it's in the basement of the building where we have our studio. Um, the proposal to have a kind of Veranstaltungs uh, realm for events um, and uh, yeah. various reasons. Uh, it's in, in consideration. And it's say. actually paying attention to the courtyards in, uh, in Riga, which is a big, big problem and question, which usually full with um, cars and unused. So it would be unique also to use a courtyard in a different way. Actually, it's, it's the old um, uh, cellar for, for keeping wood uh, uh, for winter. So actually the, the cellar already exists, and it, it exists for most of the uh, kind of rig center buildings. Uh, they're just in a kind of bad condition, and uh, we haven't seen yet a, a convincing project which would really make use of them because they're everywhere. And it's big hidden potential. Mm. And another oval, which is a sneak peek. Uh, you're not allowed to see this. <laughs> don't, don't look. <laughs> Um, uh, ASMR exhibition travels to London Design Museum uh, and it will open in 13th of May. Um, so uh, this is a kind of a conceptual sketch between the b before the value engineering. Uh, and <laughs> this is how we call it there. <laughs> And uh, this is already much more real, which has gone already in production. So what we want to say, what I want to say, so it looks uh, unbuildable, but actually we are always really working and making uh, things real. That's our goal. Uh, so it's all uh, numbered <laughs> and only since it currently uh, for the pavilion to become real. And yes, I guess we all invite you to <laughs> come to see the exhibition. It will be open to public, um, yeah, starting from 13th of May and will run for half a year. Don't know exactly yet the closing date. Um. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now, traditional questions. Hi. Mm. So, as I understand, uh, one of your big goals is to make the urban space in, in Riga more, more attractive, more enjoyable, and so on. And I'm wondering, how do you see the role of educating the general public? Uh, uh, do you think it is useful and efficient to uh, write a lot about it, articles and give lectures and so on? Or is it more efficient to just find the few developers who are actually willing to build the projects and then the people will just see what, what is good and what is not? Uh, I think uh, both ways. Uh, we are actually really believing in educating people. I mean, that's what um, we are, that's why we're building uh, the new school. And one uh, important part and platform of the new school will be a um, platform called Agency. And this will be this agent that's uh, meant to work between the school and the public and the city. It's kind of interface where we want to communicate what um, you know we do here and what we talk to a broader public and back. So this has to become kind of a, a new platform for, um, yeah, in some ways educating uh, and making more accessible the um, architecture as a discipline um, to make it more understandable to make actually in politics I think it's extremely important for people to understand that architects can help uh, that it's not some kind of elitist uh, luxury uh, thing only so it's um, about collaborating together and making decisions. 
I wanted to add that, uh, for, for example, in the Mars uh, Park uh, case, yeah, it, uh, it was just a project that triggered a kind of involvement of wider society, involvement of locals, and they could feel uh, almost they could make a difference. Yeah? And uh, now the Mars Park has become almost like a precedent. Yeah? Uh, people use it as a reference to avoid other things happening. So in that sense, it's already a success because people say, whoa, 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 you don't want the Mars Park scenario here because locals will come and really protest and this will be cut down. Uh, so we need more initiatives like this and we need more uh, active local communities. I think in reading the last, um, I think, uh, five years even, the local communities are very uh, becoming more and more active. This uh, coincides together with um, and the change also in the city government, which uh, also has sent some positive signals involving um, various specialists in uh, these decisions. And we know that finally uh, Riga, and of course we talk about Riga a lot, but uh, Riga uh, has come to a point where they say there will be now new competitions made for public spaces. This has not happened before. We had one competition for a square in front of a theater, minor things, but finally uh, this is going to start, and that's a big change. More questions? First of all, thank you very much. It was quite enjoyable. Uh, I was asked to have more questions, not just questions, so I asked to, okay? So, first of all, uh, Pandemic times, what are main lessons uh, still uh, we can borrow from you, or just some ideas? And the second, maybe later. Well, one, one thing is that uh, I think we as architects, we have a kind of um, responsibility uh, to keep people together, no matter what. Uh, we need to continue uh, doing public buildings and uh, spaces and also um, uh, living environments where people can really be together because um, the kind of isolation started by COVID is really uh, a no-go, in my opinion, at least. Uh, so there will be uh, ways in, in dealing with the pandemic and their where ways uh, dealing with the pandemic, but uh, I think it's uh, it's really time for architects to think um, um, to face this uh, real uh, issue, but uh, to keep thinking about uh, being together and being in public. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, Okay, thanks. Yeah, and the second one, uh, a bit futuristic, I feel uh, <coughs> that your art is kind of about future, I felt like this, and now my question is, if you get a project, imagine, uh, building a private atomic bunker, why not? First of all, would you accept such a project? If yes, then how, what on which principles you would Create your concept or start working. Oh God, that's an amazing question. <laughs> <laughs> How to get out of this? <laughs> well, uh, well Dagny actually bought a bunker. So we have a bunker <laughs> that's project. True. That's true, we have a bunker project. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm not building it for atomic bomb. But I think um, Kanye West already has a bunker as well. Yeah. Or at least in, in, in building underground. But you mean atomic bunker? So it's a bunker where you hide? Or uh, you know, it's become more and more actual to have a private bunker, right? just in case, you know. Uh, so yes, but actually, I have been planning private, uh, not private, but like uh, also it's public it's bunkers in Switzerland. Every building you build, you need to have a bunker as well. How old does it look like? Because uh, I see some. Spaces look like a bunker. I mean, it's very futuristic. But how this particular bunker will look like? I think you just answered it. The core of my question, I'd like to understand what, on which principles you're, you're creating, basically, your solo or your teamwork, or how you, or the process, or it's just, you know, like, like, like a secret. Ah, like, okay, so what is our 
the design decisions and the way how we come to this. Because those things are crazy. For my, is the genius they are crazy. So how this craziness comes from? You are just doing this. It is. A, <laughs> there is one answer. We really enjoy working together. <laughs> that's principle. Basically. I think I think that's the the main uh, driving force behind it. Just to have uh, enjoy and have fun and um, make the things, make them real. That's also important to us, or let's basically figure it out. And um, I think it's just we each of the projects you saw we we all worked on them together. The main uh, conceptual decisions are done always together, maybe even just three of us first, when we know, because we know that if we don't know and we start to work in our office with other people, then we have 25 options. <laughs> it's not uh, entirely the way we do. We don't choose out of 25 different ideas. We always, um, somehow the first idea, what we have discussed and what we liked, we always try to keep to it somehow. It's almost like a stubborn mind to, uh, to kind of uh, keep the value of the first thing you thought. Um, but sometimes uh, <coughs> our people in office, they're like, we need an idea, <laughs> like, where is it? Like, we need somehow a clear answer. And we say, well, that's, that's not how it comes. You, you don't really start with clear answer. And uh, sometimes we exhaust projects till, you know, last deadlines and, uh, and uh, we're... I think that's how the process works. It's, uh, it's uh, non-linear, actually. Yeah. And uh, if we had to do another lecture, it would just be a continuous uh, uh, WhatsApp to scroll. When you go to WhatsApp, you can choose uh, all media, and you can just see you can see like a cross section of your entire process. And this is uh, just uh, incredible what what is there. When you when you see it like this, it's just uh, you have already forgotten what you have been through. But really, yeah. But for each project, we have a WhatsApp uh, internal kind of um, chat, and then uh, the, I was uh, the other day showing um, <coughs> someone our Garkal and the kindergarten project, and the way how I do it, I will go in the WhatsApp, and then I scroll through the the line. And the uh, crazy things come out, and but we realize people are really wanting to see this. <laughs> it's like uh, sometimes we, we, we probably show, but uh, uh, the process is uh, very interesting to record the thought. Me and my last one, the process, uh, a fear factor in your process. Is it important? Or do you think does it have any value? You have some rejection experience, maybe it's not nothing for you, but still. Fear factor. You mean fear, fear. fear. No fear. Uh, hashtag no fear. And, uh, and the thing is that uh, we, we have realized that uh, actually the ideas always keep uh, living. And uh, there's another way to do them. And they kind of trans transmit to another place, another time. And they never, uh, they never die in a way. They just transform. Um, not here. <laughs> Thank you. I will take it over from here. First of all, I think I was right calling when I was right. <laughs> Office <laughs> practice from that the most of the government. I think I think I, I was quite quite on point on that. Uh, but um, discussing what you said in the beginning, like the naivety of returning from Switzerland and uh, to actually deal with local context and the uh, and, and sort of uh, coming from exile to be a, a, a practitioner in, in Latvia. And I, I was wondering about the certain advantages that uh, it brings. You know, you, you, you make your ideas more graspable and you sort of start understanding how, um, how things could be more maybe feasible and standardized, but at the same time, there's there's also, I guess, a lot of disadvantages of this dumbed-down methods of approaching things, and of course, there's certain smartness in it. So I'm, I'm just wondering how to, or I'm wondering how you're doing this uh, to how to stop the smooth curve from exile architect to an exile architect, because that's what um, might often happen when you when you yeah you're uh, ambitious uh, uh, out 
outward in in a first world country living uh, architect and then you become the sort of the excel master don't get fooled of this lecture because half of the time we do spend on excel yeah <laughs> of course I mean, no, uh, the, the thing about uh, our practice is that, I mean, uh, architects' uh, practice is that there is um, a lot of uh, freedom often, but there is hardcore, uh, like uh, other part and complexity, which is exactly that. You have to keep your accounting, you have to, uh, you know, make sure that uh, something doesn't collapse. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, it will, things will last, uh, that uh, they don't break, that uh, you don't get sued. Uh, um, I mean, it is very serious. Um, so I think uh, it's, I don't know if there's a curve or it's more like just parallel lines that just become thicker and thicker and <laughs> thicker. Yeah. No, I think the yeah. term Excel architecture, it, it's been used in, in local context at least, uh -huh. uh, also in terms of like using always the like standardized uh, yeah. elements from, from the Excel. So it's not only about counting, yeah. but um, but uh, more, more about the idea of, uh, of still trying to have uh, custom-made solutions or, or trying to sort of tweak the, the straightforward line uh, from A to B. We, uh, we also, I think, we try, um, we're not pushing only for custom made solutions. We are also trying always to use smartly solutions that we have to bring up something new. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're very interested just to make new things. It's like in our DNA, I think, is about actually making a space where experiential space. So where you get some kind of experience you didn't. You don't have somewhere else. We are like addicts, you know. When you see something uh, that has already been done, they're like, oh no, it's done before. We cannot do this. <laughs> like, for example, we never, we don't look too much on um, when we have to do a new idea. We don't look at other buildings. We look at, I don't know, strange stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Anything can happen. <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, of course, we are getting more pragmatic, but I think it's just good because then uh, we can build also buildings which are like in the kindergarten. Uh, this is kind of the test how far we can stretch mm -hmm. to standard, to pragmatic and still have a luxury of space or a kind of still have feeling that you are like given something that you wouldn't have in a normal, in a kind of a standardized uh, project. Uh, and trying to fill, fit it in, in the budgets and in the costs and everything by choosing basically the, uh, the priorities. So it's always have to, we ha always have to have a very clear conceptual idea of what's the main, what's the main thing you do, why? And then if you have it, then it's very easy to do the decisions, to, to downgrade when you have to cut the costs. Um, this is somehow I think we... <laughs> Thanks. So if there is no objections in the format of a last question, we uh, owe them a big applause.